Uh, I guess I, I was noticing just how frequently you're being raked over the coals by people who are chapter and verse, you know, Talmudically analyzing your words, but some words and not others. And the balance of the message is, gets altered. And, and it seemed like at times everyone is, is speaking past one another. And I just thought I might be able to throw in some, some suggestions. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that, um, if we that would be awesome. If we part of our lives in, in the public eye, then that, that, uh, we could have something to share. Yeah. Well, but before we get into that, I think that's going to be fascinating and, and useful. This is almost certainly unnecessary. I think most of my listeners are as aware of you as they are of me at this point. But for those few who aren't, how do you describe what you do? And just to give us a, a brief sense of how you spend your time in the world. Yeah, that's a great question because it's, I don't even know if I can answer that with any coherence of late. But I'm fundamentally an astrophysicist. It's how I think. It's how my brain is wired. And uh, I have this delusional uh, this delusional thought that after I write all the books that I want to write and do the TV that I can do, that I'm going to go back to the lab <laughs> and just escape back to the lab and, and publish papers again. But in the meantime, um, <clears throat> I've spent a good fraction of my professional life bringing the universe down to earth, in a sense. And uh, one of the ways that has been most successful, I have found, is if I lace science onto this scaffold that we might call pop culture. And because you don't have to build that scaffold, it's already there, ready to be clad. And once you find a place to insert science, then the science can be immediately absorbed because people care deeply about their pop culture icons and ideas and thoughts. And just the simplest example I can give is during the Super Bowl, you can't get more pop culture than that. Everybody's watching the Super Bowl. I'll just take the time to tweet any bit of physics that comes to my mind as I'm watching the game. Uh, physics of the momentum of, of linebackers, the, the spiral stabilized throw of a quarterback. Um, and in one particular playoff game, there was a kick, a, an overtime field goal winning kick that hit the left upright of the goalposts and went in for the win. And I said, wait a minute, what's the orientation of that stadium? I checked quickly and I ran a quick calculation and I, I felt confident enough to tweet that that score was enabled by a third of an inch deflection to the right due to Earth's rotation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just the Coriolis force of Earth's right. rotation. Right. And so that was fun to calculate. and But people like lost their minds. Like, wow, I didn't know that. Okay. And then it went on to the, 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 the websites and, and it's, it's, it's reaction functions such as that, that remind me that people can care about science in ways you might not have imagined, provided it's properly or, 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 um, playfully folded into the pop culture they already care about. Yeah. And obviously we're going to get into areas of science affecting the public interests that are that are far more consequential than field goals but a little bit more on on your place in the world at the moment what what are you currently working on you have your own podcast and if i'm not mistaken you're taking that on television in the fall is that do i have that right yeah so uh, thanks for mentioning that so we've had a podcast called well it was a radio show called star talk and uh, it began about five or six years ago on a grant from the national science foundation and the experiment was can we make a viable product, radio product, bringing science to the public to people who either don't know that they like science or know that they don't like science? Is that even possible? And that's what started this pathway into pop culture. So we inverted the normal Science Friday model where you have a journalist interviewing a scientist. And in this particular case, I am the interviewer, I'm the scientist, and my guest is hardly ever a scientist. It's a famous actor, actress, a, a, um, an inventor, an explorer, a singer, a performer. And the conversation explores any science that may have touched that person's life. If not, then do they have a secret geek underbelly that we can rub? Often people, you know, maybe they're science fiction fanatics or they, they love superheroes or any, any of the topics that would be fair game at a Comic-Con, 
do any of them have these kinds of leanings? And what happens is, since they are hewn from pop culture, they bring a fan base to this conversation, that, a fan base that wouldn't otherwise have an excuse to listen to science. And then in that conversation, they get fed science as it matters to the person they care about. And we started this out, it became very successful very quickly, and over several years, the grant money ran out, but then we became commercially viable. And that was the intent. And then we got noticed by National Geographic Channel, and then we jumped species, and now we're also on, on television. And so we're going to our second season this fall. Well, that's great. I, li I like that model. Oh, and by the way, the model is a little more subtle than that. If we get an act, you know, typically an actor might have an interest that touches science, but of course they don't have the expertise necessarily in that topic. They could be pro-environment or anti-this or pro-that. And that comes out in the interview. But what we then do in studio, th th that's the base interview. Then we cut that into a, into a, a, a show where in studio we bring in an academic expert on that topic. So the best example here was uh, I interviewed uh, uh, President Jimmy Carter. And, you know, he's got this, uh, he's working heavily by ridding uh, uh, sub-Saharan Africa of certain diseases that are peculiar to humans. And once you remove it from the last human, it'll never come back again because uh, it doesn't have the contagious vector. So he's speaking about this, but he's not an expert in that disease. We got a we we got someone who's an expert in in transmittable diseases to supplement comments that he made about the mission statement of his causes. So so this it turns out this has been working, and we even got a, a an Emmy nomination for best informational programming this past season. So all quite proud of it because it was got crafted and and molded and and assembled. But other than that, we're in conversation about whether we're going to do another Cosmos, because uh, I hosted the, that 21st century. Yeah, um, that was reboot. huge. Yeah, yeah. It was a very big, and I aired on Fox in prime time, and then scattered around the world on the National Geographic Channel. So science, I'd like to think that science is trending in some way, at least among some demographics. How much did Cosmos bump up your profile? I mean, you, you were already quite famous before that, but has it changed your day-to-day -day interaction with the public? Uh, so that, that's a great question. So there, there, are, there, are, there are numerical ways to assess this. One of them is how many times a day does a complete stranger come up to me and say, aren't you the guy, aren't you? There's that, that's a number, and that, and that changes, right? Another number is just purely how many Twitter followers do you have? That's sort of a monotonically increasing function for anyone, because rarely do you unfollow someone on Twitter. And so during Cosmos, the, the, the Twitter numbers bumped up, but by maybe 10% or so, not like 50% or 100%. And so it was, I think a lot of people who watch Cosmos already knew me and already followed. So, and I think that's a stronger statement than if it was just some spontaneous spike, because it means it was kind of sort of earned. People are coming on, they see retweets, and, they, and, and it's kind of the, the slow build I think is a stronger number at the end of the day. And by, by contrast, when Charlie Sheen announced he would be on Twitter, 24 hours later, he had a million followers. They're not following him because of the tweets he had posted. They're following because they're, they're fans of his or they want to see him crash and burn, wh whichever. And so the, my Twitter following, however, has been very slow but real. And I, I like that because it meant that people are responding to the tweets themselves. Well, and it's great to see your platform grow by whatever metric because you are so good at publicly communicating science. And I think there are people who are cynical about that role when, when a scientist assumes it. You know, I think they're, they're, undoubtedly there are scientists who attack you as a, a mere popularizer of science. I mean, they, they did the same thing to Sagan. They do the same thing to Steven Pinker. Well, let me just put that to you. How much does that noise even show up on your, your radar? That's a great question and an important question. And I can say, let me just say, I benefit from the fact that Carl Sagan sort of did this first. And he sort of cleared the brush and bramble. And, you know, there's blood on the tracks from him having done this in a way that no one had even approximated before. So now here I am on a partially, if not mostly, cleared field. And I get to operate without what I'm doing surprising people. That's the, the first point. A second point, and this is I take this very seriously. Uh, how do I retain this respect of my colleagues? 
let me assume for the moment that the respect is still there because <laughs> would they tell me directly? I, I don't know if they no longer respect me. But what I do know is that I, have de- I live in New York City, which is the news gathering headquarters of the United States. And even CNN opened an office here, having only ever been in, in Atlanta. So everybody's here. Whenever there's a late breaking news story, let's say the gravity wave was discovered a few months ago or the Higgs boson, I, I, my phone rings off the hook. And what I say to the press is, especially the, the TV media, I say, uh, have you spoken to the people who actually did this work yet? No, 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 no. We just want you to get, tell us what was discovered and why. I said, no, speak to them first. These people worked for decades, finally getting a result. It's their time in the sun. Talk to them, then come back to me, and I'll be happy to tie a bow on it. Okay? And I've actually cultivated this relationship with the national media based here in New York, and that's precisely what they do. So if you look at news stories of major, major scientific discoveries that overlap my interest and my expertise, um, if I come in, it's at the end, and I say what the discovery means or its significance. And in that way, I think all, t- the t- all boats rise in the tide waters. And I can't be criticized for that if, by my being a part of that story, brings more attention to their work. And so I've been very careful about that. And as a result, I still every now and then get invitations to do a year sabbatical at prestigious institutions. And I don't think that would happen if somehow people felt that I was, uh, I was a loose cannon out there. Right. I, I don't think people are aware of how much heat Sagan took for this. I might not even be aware of most of the details, but I just know in the abstract that he got fairly hammered by his colleagues for his role as a communicator of science. Is that correct? Yeah. So, so it happens on many dimensions. I mean, cons- some of it is just what is, the, what is the state of social maturity of the academic field? And even his closest collaborator for the original Cosmos, uh, Steve Soder, who was also co-writer of the Cosmos that I co-writer with Andrewian, of the Cosmos that I hosted, he, at the time, back in the 70s, when Carl Sagan was invited to appear on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson, he thought it would be a mistake. How could you do this? This is entertainment. This is not news. He's a comedian. This is it. You'll be destroying science. And, and once that got unfolded and Johnny Carson turned out to be a fan of science and of skepticism, and all of a sudden, uh, <laughs> uh, members of Congress would hear from their constituents, oh, I think maybe we should do more science. Wait, is that the science that I saw on TV last night? Good, let's do that. And all of a sudden, funding streams would increase. And so my field, the, the, the ast- astrophysics field, we were kind of early out of the box on this, and we did recognize ultimately even in spite of the blood on the tracks, that it's a good thing for science, for people who, in the end, paid for the science through the national science tax monies that fund NASA, the National Science Foundation, and other sort of government agencies that serve this. In the biology field, of course, it's the National Institutes of Health, this sort of thing. If they're paying for it, at some point, they ought to know what you're doing. And if you can be good at that, then everybody benefits. So my field, I think we're, we're, we've matured past that. And now we can celebrate one another who have given some of their lives to, again, like, as I said, bring the universe down to earth. And resistance to this seems to me to be short-sighted and confused on at least two levels, a resistance to the public communication of, of science or the, or the stigma that attaches to a scientist who spends a lot of time or even most of his time doing this. Because one, as you say, we, we want a scientifically informed public. And I think it's, it's pretty easy to see the price we pay for people's scientific ignorance on you know, climate change or any other topic that is, is socially and politically divisive at the moment. But also there's just this idea that there's, a, there's some kind of clear boundary between the context in which you can make original and useful contributions to scientific thought. It's though in the covers of a 300-page book, all you could possibly be doing as a scientist is selling out, whereas in, in a, the context of a journal article that only 300 people are going to read, there you're doing real science. And, I mean, this demarcation may make a little sense in in pure mathematics, for instance, because, you know, no, one, no one's going to publish your theorem proof widely. 
and you're not going to put it on PBS or um, <laughs> you know your next your next show. But for for most of science, you have people like, as I mentioned, Steven Pinker, who, in the context of a book, is saying scientifically edgy and original things. And it's not mere. I mean, the, the the boundary between communicating science to the public and doing science in the act of you know just thinking out loud about data. I mean, there is no clear boundary between those things. Yeah, there shouldn't be. I think and. In, in, in my field, we have the, it's just a fact. I, 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 I don't know, do I judge it as a positive or a negative? It just is that when we make discoveries, there's huge public interest in them. If we discover a new black hole, a new exoplanet, a new, you know, organic molecules in space, the, the edge of the universe, the multiverse, our topics tend to be more ripe for public absorption than what I have found to be true in other fields, except, say, for perhaps medicine, where people's health and well-being are directly affected by discoveries. And so, and also our content feeds very smoothly into, the, into movie making and the storytelling of, of science fiction. And our vocabulary is actually, we shouldn't underestimate the value of a tractable vocabulary as part of formal lexicon. Consider that the official name, the official term for the beginning of the universe is Big Bang. That's the official term. And what, how about this region of space you fall in and you don't go, black hole, right? So light doesn't come out, black hole. We, we, we have this trove of single syllable words that are actually official in our field that are just fun for the public to follow. So that when I'm describing new discoveries, there isn't this smoke screen of lexicon that you have to get through just to even hear the idea that I'm trying to put on the table. The idea be becomes, the, the, the idea is laid bare immediately because the words don't get in the way. So, and, and many of those topics, as you point out, are not, I mean, they're certainly not politicized. I guess the Big Bang, if you reach back far enough uh, into our confusion, that the Big Bang becomes politicized. <laughs> Or you, you could just say it happened 6,000 years ago. <laughs> but you communicate, I think you communicate on some more highly charged issues as well. I mean, so is climate science something you're, you're touching or have touched well, in great, recent years? Uh, thanks for bringing that up. I, I don't present myself as a climate expert. There are plenty of climate experts out there. So when the press calls to me and says, what do you think of that storm brewing in, in the Caribbean? And I'll say, call a climate expert. What are you calling me? And yes, I could comment on it, but I won't because you have – what I'm trying to do is spread the, the, the Rolodex base of who they would call when they need commentary. Now, when you take a step back from that and they ask, tell us about our responsibility as citizens on planet Earth, then there's the larger stratospheric, the, the cosmic perspective on it that I'm delighted to bring to the dialogue. And – so, but people, I'm, I'm a visible target and people know how to find my Twitter stream. And so people who are climate deniers will try to fight that. But I try to always take the high road. I'm not interested in fighting you in the trenches. So for example, I had a tweet recently that did very well if you measure it by retweets. And it was, uh, I just had to put it out there. I said, if you, uh, uh, a skeptic is someone who doubts the claim and is convinced by evidence. And a denier is someone who doubts the claim and doubts the evidence. Mm. <laughs> so, so something like, I think my tweet was better constructed than that. And I put that out there because in the trenches is let's fight about climate change. No, I think as an educator, I can help train your mind how to think about information and how to process information and how to arrive at conclusions. Because this, this is the, the ways and means of what science is and how and why it works. Then you're empowered. And then you, you, you can make whatever politically leaning decisions you must, but have them anchor on objectively verifiable science. That's my goal. But that's why you don't see me debating people. I, I just, I don't have the time or the patience. I'd rather just educate you in the first place so that the debating...